gracious God, may the words of my mouth and may the meditation of a heart may it be pleasing to you. Now many of you here are training for ministry and some of you are currently involved in ministry, be it in terms of leading worship, counseling others, teaching Bible studies, preaching, leading youth groups, and in your service and in your ministry towards others, you will invariably face severe disappointments and setbacks that will test your resolve and your commitment to your ministry. And the setbacks could come in many various forms. It could be opposition from others who have a different philosophy of ministry, illness of your loved ones, it could be the seemingly lack of fruit in your ministry. And these setbacks may lead to disillusionment, disappointment, depression, passivity, burnout. And according to an article that came out in the New York Times in 2010, he, it reads that members of the clergy now suffer from obesity, hypertension, and depression at rates higher than most Americans. In the last decade itself, their use of antidepressants has risen, while their life expectancy has fallen. Many would change jobs if they could. And according to some statistics, 57% said that they would leave the pastorate if they had somewhere else to go or some other vocation they could do. The difficulties and setbacks we face may lead us to question our adequacy, our sufficiency, and our competency for ministry. But the passage that we are gonna be taking a look at today tells us that despite the setbacks and difficulties we face, we can be confident in our adequacy for ministry when we faithfully proclaim the word of God. Now the context of 2 Corinthians 3 falls within 2.14 all the way to 7.4, which is sometimes considered as the great digression, where Paul really describes his apostolic ministry. But the reason why Paul digresses and speaks about his apostolic ministry is because there were major problems, major problems between him and the, and the church. And a major segment of the church here in Corinth did not trust his authority or legitimacy as an apostle. Moreover, there were Jewish Judaizers that came down to, from Judea and that infiltrated the Corinthian church who claimed to be Christians but were actually Judaizers. And these Judaizers further poisoned the minds of the church against the apostle. And these must be some of the accusations that were going in their minds that they would probably have said. They would have said that Paul uses his letters to intimidate, to frighten, and to shame us after all, in 1 Corinthians 6, he says, I write this to your shame. In 1 Corinthians 15, I write this to your shame again. Others would say that Paul is deceptive. When he came to teach us, we offered to give him a stipend. But he insulted us by refusing our good intentions. And then after he left, he had the nerve to have his agents organize a collection. Now, supposedly, this collection was for the Jerusalem church, but we are sure that a part of it went into his own pockets. And some of them would say that we are not sure he's a true apostle. After all, he's not one of the twelve that were personally chosen by the Lord Jesus. He claims that the Lord Jesus appeared to him in a vision, but how can we verify that? Moreover, he didn't have any letters of recommendation that could certify that he was a bona fide apostle. So in the midst of such opposition, difficulties, discouragement, troubles, where Paul even despaired of life itself, Paul gives us two reasons why we can be confident in our adequacy for ministry. This first one concerns the strength for our ministry, and that we can be confident because the strength for ministry comes from God. It does not come from ourselves, and this occurs in the first six verses. The other reason why we can be confident is that it regards the substance of a ministry, and that we can be confident because the gospel mediates the definitive way to obtain life with God. 
and this occurs in the rest of chapter 3. Now let's take a look at the first reason here where Paul says that we can be confident because our strength for ministry comes not from ourselves but from God. It reads, are we beginning to commend ourselves again or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of a ministry written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. The situation that Paul addresses regarding letters of recommendation probably stems from the arrival of these Judaizers. And these Judaizers came to the church in Corinth carrying letters of rec recommendation from the Judean churches. They probably said something like this. We all know that Jerusalem is a fount of Christianity. Those working outside Jerusalem must therefore be able to give proof of their commission by these letters of recommendation. We brought you letters from Jerusalem, thus proving that we are properly credentialed for ministry. Paul, on the other hand, he has no such letters. And he's not concerned about being credentialed or certified. His work is therefore, therefore not legitimate. Now, in the ancient world, letters of recommendation were important. And there's plenty of evidence where people sought letters of recommendation from people of high status. And there was a saying that went around saying, to be praised by a praised man. And that the Romans sought to be praised by someone who was himself praised and had high honor. After all, the worth of your letter of recommendation was in proportion to the worth or honor of the recommender. Now, letters of recommendation are still so true, still so needed today. How many are you going to graduate school? How many of you want to do doc academic program? How many of you are going to be asking your faculty for letters of recommendation? Now, in the business world, we all know that networking is so important. You hear the old cliche, it's not what you know, but it's who you know. And if you want to do business in China, well, you need to have the right guan, guan si. You need to have the right relationship. And in Silicon Valley, well, you just need to be LinkedIn. You just need to have LinkedIn to write network. When Paul was confronted with the need for letters of recommendation, Paul declares that he does not need any such letters because the transformed lives of the Corinthians is that very letter itself. Now, it must be important that Paul does not reject the use of letters of recommendation. After all, he had written them for his co-workers such as Phoebe, Timothy, and Titus. What he really disputes is the need for any letter of recommendation to them. After all, he was their spiritual father. He was the one who planted their church. Their very existence as a church of Christ, their changed lives, is a testament it's empirical proof that he is an apostle, a worthy minister of God. To require Paul right now to prove that he is a bona fide minister would undermine their status as a church of God. The Corinthians had no confidence in Paul and thus wanted letters of recommendation. But Paul flips that around and says that he has great confidence in the church. And the Corinthian church is this letter of recommendation that is engraved in his heart. And that he boldly talks about the Corinthian church everywhere he goes. And it's a letter that is known and read by everyone. But really, would you put the Corinthian church on your resume? <laughs> would you use the Corinthian church as a letter of recommendation? After all, it was a church filled with massive problems. There was incest there, someone was sleeping with his father's wife. Believers in the church were taking one another, they were defrauding one another, and they were taking each other to court. Someone was going to pagan temples to eat food offered to idols during the Lord's Supper. Some were hungry and some were drunk. Is that the kind of church you want to put on your resume? Now, Paul was aware of all of these problems. He definitely was, but he also views the church fundamentally for who they were, their identity and their status, and that the Corinthian church showed themselves to be a letter from Christ, 
the result of a ministry. It could be translated automatically as, you show that you are a letter that Christ wrote, that Christ is writing, and that we are just the secretary that typed out the letter. And this fact is liberating, for there are times when we are going to be disappointed that the people to whom we are ministering are not displaying the fruits of the Spirit, despite the time and energy that we pour into their lives. And in times like these, we need to remind ourselves that Christ, ultimately, is the one who is effecting the transformation, and that we are only the assistants to Christ. Christ is the one that's writing the letter in the hearts of the people that we minister to. And it's a letter written not with ink that can fade away, but it's written by the indelible work of the Spirit of the living God. It is a letter that will not fail because it is written not on tablets of stone, but on their hearts. And it is a letter that is written by the Spirit that is transforming their lives. And in the midst of this transformation, where Christ giving the Spirit is doing the work, that Christ calls us to be faithful in just discharging our ministries to faithfully proclaim the gospel. Now Paul continues in verse 4 and saying that such confidence we have through Christ before God, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God, and that he had made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. Now in this section here, then Paul remarks that the confidence he has for ministry comes from God through Christ before God. It comes from God, it comes through Christ, and it comes before God. And we might think that Paul's confidence for his ministry stems from the effectiveness of his ministry, after all, he had already planted a church. But he remarks that the confidence for his ministry ultimately is from God, and that God is the one who makes him competent, that makes him sufficient for ministry. Moreover, this confidence is mediated through Christ, and that it is possible because of his union with Christ, and that ultimately this confidence is before God, and it is directed towards God in that God is the one whom we ultimately have to give account. Now Shakespeare said that all the world is a stage and all the men and women are mere players. And if everybody is an actor, who is the audience? And that there is no audience other than God. And he is the one to whom we must give account. A ministry is not meant to impress others, but ultimately to give glory to God. You are training to be ministers of the new covenant, and invariably you will face setbacks and difficulties in your ministry. And in the midst of these difficulties, what will be the basis of your confidence? For some of you who are extremely gifted, and there are some of you, you might think, my confidence for ministry stems from the training that I receive at TED. After all, I got A's in my exegesis papers to prove it. I'm sure that must count for something. Others might say that I'm intelligent. After all, I have degrees from Harvard, Yale, and Duke to prove it. Some of you might say I got a good track record. The churches that I planted, the blogs that I'm participating in, the books that I've written, the academic prizes that I've won, all of this, I'm sure, must come for something. But what about some of you who don't have these gifts and talents? Those who struggle with memorizing Greek, Hebrew, who consistently get C's in your papers, but yet who are certain that God has called you to ministry. You may say that I may not have all these gifts, but by golly, I'm gonna work harder than all of them. I'm gonna sleep just five hours a day consistently. But I tell you, on a long-term basis, that may be a recipe for burnout and fatigue. Now, our skills, our talents, or lack of them, they're all important factors. But ultimately, they cannot be the basis of our confidence because they will eventually fail. For example, your strength will eventually fail, will give out. 
Your ability to recall facts and data will fail when you get older. Moreover, there'll be situations where you may have the skills, but you don't have the time to use the skills to prepare yourself adequately. And instead of focusing on our abilities, we have to constitute an attitude of total dependence on God. An attitude of total dependence of God. And this attitude was exemplified by this Chinese evangelist by the name of John Sung. Sung Chanzia, for those of you who know Chinese. And my grandmother had the opportunity to hear him preach when he came to Malaysia in the 1940s. And before his dedication to Christian ministry, John Sung came to the US to study chemistry in the 1920s. And he finished his bachelor's, his master's, and his PhD in chemistry at Ohio Wesleyan University in a span of six years. I wish I could do something like that. And all the while, he was supporting himself doing menial work. He was truly gifted and achieved many academic awards and letters. But he underwent a dramatic conversion at an evangelistic rally and decided to return to China to do evangelistic work. And as the slow boat to China, as it approached the harbor there, he threw overboard all his academic achievements, all the letters, all the prizes that he had won. He only kept one, his doctoral diploma, in respect for his father. But he threw overboard all the rest to signify his reliance not on his academic achievements, not on worldly things, but to exemplify a total dependence upon God. Now Paul tells us that our confidence for ministry cannot rest on abilities, but must rest on the strength and competency that God provides. And if it rests on the strength and competency that God provides, then the way that we access that strength must be through prayer, must be through intense prayer. And as we prepare for ministry then, we must also spend time where we bathe our ministry in prayer. So that is the first point that Paul emphasizes us, that our confidence for ministry comes from us, not from our strength, but from the strength of God. Next one comes the confidence of a ministry relies on the substance of a ministry in that the gospel truly mediates the definitive way to God. Now, in the second part of this chapter, Paul compares the new covenant with the old. And he argues that the new covenant supersedes and surpasses the old covenant as the definitive way to life with God. And the argument proceeds in two parts. In 7 to 11, Paul says that the new covenant supersedes the old covenant and that it possesses a greater glory that is permanent. And in the latter part, verses 12 to 8, Paul says that the new covenant supersedes the old covenant in that it provides open and direct access to God. Now taking a look at the first part here, where the new covenant possesses a greater glory. Paul begins the comparison of the old and the new actually in verse six, so we'll pick up from there. All right, in verse six, Paul says, he has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now if the ministry that brought death, that is the old covenant, which was engraved on, in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of his glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit, that is the new covenant, be even more glorious? Now, if the ministry that brought condemnation, that is the old covenant, if that was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness, that is the new covenant? For what was glorious, that is the old covenant, it has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory that is the glory of the new covenant. And if what was transitory, that is the old covenant, if that came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? So in these verses here, Paul contrasts the old with the new and argues that the new covenant and its ministry is superior in every way to the old covenant and its ministry. So in verse six, Paul draws upon various Old Testament passages and distinguishes between the old and the new. 
The old covenant is the covenant of the letter that brings condemnation and death. It consists of external commandments on tablets of stone. Nevertheless, it did not provide the power or the means for fulfilling these commandments. And because it did not provide the means for fulfilling these commandments, it eventually lead, led to death. The new covenant or the, or the heaven is the covenant of the spirit that brings righteousness and life. It promises the spirit that provides the divine enablement to do God's will and therefore leads to life. Now in verses seven to 11, Paul then continues the, the contrast between these two covenants. The old covenant is glorious, but it has a glory that fades. The new covenant possesses a glory that surpasses the old because it is permanent. In this part here, Paul is alluding to the story of Exodus 34. And if you remember the story of Exodus 34, after Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the second set of tablets that contained the covenant law, the skin on his face shone with glory. Do you remember that? And actually, there's a bit of trivia here, you know, and that the language for the Hebrew verb for shine is karan, which only occurs in this passage. And it comes from the word karen, which means horn. So the Latin Vulgate translated this passage there to say that Moses like wore a mask with horns. So that's why if you take a look at the sculpture of Moses by Michelangelo, you see that there are two horns on his head. All right, so anyway, that's where you know that came from here. But here, you know, with Moses here, with his face shining, and the people were afraid to come near to him. Thus, it was, became Moses' practice to put a veil over his face when he spoke to the people. But he took it off when he entered the Lord's presence in the tent of meeting. Now, when Paul picks up and alludes to this story, he picks up on a Jewish tradition that viewed Moses' glory as being temporary. And for Paul, the glory on Moses' face symbolizes the glory of the old covenant, and that it is a covenant whose ministry and glory is eclipsed by the advent of the new covenant. And Paul therefore then makes several comparisons to show the superiority of the new covenant. Now, if this is true of the old covenant, then this is certainly more true of the old covenant. So if the ministry of the latter is glorious, then the ministry of the Spirit is even more glorious. If the ministry that brings condemnation is glorious, then the ministry that brings righteousness is more glorious. In all of this, the implication is to show the superiority of the new covenant. And so what? Paul answers it in verse 12. Therefore, since we have such a hope, the hope that the new covenant is permanent, that is irrevocable, and that is never to be superseded or surpassed in glory, we are very bold. Bold in proclaiming the gospel. Bold in affirming its efficacy to transform lives. Bold in announcing it and proclaiming that it is the power of salvation to everyone who believes. But the language that Paul alludes to in verse 12 does not just only describe his attitude his boldness in proclaiming the gospel. When Paul says that we are very bold, Paul is also describing the character of the new covenant ministry in that it is a ministry that is open, direct, plain, offering direct access to God, boldness towards God. And this stands in contrast to Moses' ministry that is hidden, that is enigmatic, and that is obscure. And then Paul says that we are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face, verse 13, to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, 
who is the spirit. This is a completely dense passage. <laughs> and I can only provide a quick overview of this section here, all right? So forgive me for that. Now, verse 13 is a difficult verse to interpret because it seems to suggest that Paul is bad-mouthing Moses, all right? And Paul says that we are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. And when Paul, it seems to suggest that when Paul says that we are not like Moses, one possible reading would be to say that Paul is comparing himself directly to Moses, as if to suggest that Paul is straightforward Paul is honest, while Moses was deceptive, covering his face so that the Israelites wouldn't be able to find out that the glory on his face was really fading. That's one reading, but I don't think that it is likely. When Paul says that we are not like Moses, he is not so much comparing himself with Moses as he is comparing the ministry that he represents with the ministry that Moses represents, and that the new covenant ministry that Paul represents is marked by boldness, openness, with unveiled faces, whereas the old covenant ministry that Moses represents is marked by hiddenness and is marked by a veil. So in verse 13 here, Paul alludes to the story of Exodus 34, and then he interprets Moses' action in a salvation historical perspective. And that the literal veil that Moses placed on his face now functions as a metaphorical veil that prevents the Israelites from seeing the true significance of the old covenant. And that it was coming to an end and that its glory was to be superseded by a new covenant. Thus, whenever Moses put on this veil, he was actually acting out a parable a parable that indicated the old covenant was indeed on its way out and that it would be superseded by the new covenant. But the Israelites were not able to perceive this parable because, as verse 14 says, their minds were made dull. They were made dull by the hardness of their hearts. And in the next chapter, Paul would say that it is Satan, the God of this age, that has blinded the minds of unbelievers. So whenever Moses is read, whenever the covenant that Moses represents is read, the same veil remains. And that the literal veil that Moses put on his face still functions as a metaphorical veil that covers the hearts of the Jews and that prevents them from perceiving that the old covenant is eclipsed by another covenant. What is the solution to this problem? And Paul remarks that it is the new covenant. For when anyone turns to the Lord, that is, turns in conversion to the Lord Jesus Christ, the veil is then abolished, it is removed. They will then be able to discern the true meaning of the glory of the old covenant and that it was in fact pointing to another covenant that had surpassing and permanent glory. And all of this is possible because the Lord Jesus Christ is the Spirit not in the sense that they are the same persons, but that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord of the new covenant of the Spirit and that he mediates and he gives the Holy Spirit. And wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Not freedom to do whatever you want, but freedom from the covenant that kills. Freedom from the obligation to observe rules as a means of attaining righteousness of God. Freedom from condemnation, freedom from the veil, freedom from bondage to Satan, and freedom of access to God. And when we have this access to God, when we come face to face with God without a veil, just as Moses when he was in the tent of meetings and he took off his veil to see God, we all behold God's glory in the person of Jesus as represented to us in the gospel and that we all then reflect God's glory and are transformed into his image but not like Moses, whose glory fades away, our glory eventually increases day by day with the transformation of the inner man, with the character of the person, as we are molded more and more into the image of his son, who ultimately 
is the perfect image of God, so that we ultimately become who God has created us to be, image bearers of God, of the divine God. Now, in this, these verses here, Paul demonstrates the superiority of the new over the old. Under the old, only Moses reflected the glory of God, but in the new, all believers behold and reflect the glory of God. In the old, Jews read the law with veiled hearts, but in the new, all believers with unveiled faces see in the gospel the glory of God. In the old, the glory is displayed outwardly on Moses' face, but in the new, the glory is displayed inwardly in the inner man as our character and as our mind is transformed more and more into the mind of Christ. In the old, the glory of Moses faded, but in the new, our glory increases until finally we will attain the glorious body like that of the risen Lord Jesus. So in all these ways, Paul shows that the new covenant ministry is superior to the old. And it is superior in that the new covenant ministry of the gospel mediates the true way to obtain life with God. And therefore, since we have such a hope in the power of the gospel which is able to give us life, which is able to set us free from bondage, which is able to give us access to the King of Kings, which is so glorious in that it mediates the power of God that will one day transform our frail, our broken physical bodies into that of the exalted Christ. Since we have this hope, Paul says, we do not lose heart. We are very bold. And we are very bold in proclaiming the gospel. What is the opposite of boldness? Timidity? Fear? Shame? And Paul says that we don't need to be timid about proclaiming the gospel. We don't need to be fearful about proclaiming the gospel. And we certainly don't need to be ashamed about the gospel. For you all know, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? for it is the power of salvation to everyone who believes. But are we ashamed of the gospel? In what ways are we ashamed of the gospel? And there are some, when we don't share the gospel at all, it indicates that we are ashamed of the gospel, for we don't share things that we are ashamed of. We are also ashamed of the gospel when we are afraid of offending people. Now this is especially true in social media, in Facebook, where you carefully edit what you say so that it doesn't offend your non-Christian friends. But, but our gospel is offensive. It is offensive. Paul, after all, says that it is a stumbling block to Jews and it is foolishness to Gentiles. The gospel will invariably divide people. And the gospel is right at the heart of a Christianity that seeks to turn the world upside down for God. Now, Carl Henry had said that a Christianity without a passion to turn the world upside down is not reflective of apostolic Christianity at all. And that if we are to be bold for the gospel, then we cannot be intimidated, we cannot be afraid to offend others. At other times, we are ashamed of the gospel when we don't share the full gospel. We share only a part of the gospel. We tell people that God is love, that God loves them, but we leave out the part, the aspects that speak of God's anger, that speak of God's justice, that speak of God's holiness, that speak of the need for repentance. Here, Paul tells us that the gospel is the ultimate the true way, the definitive way to life with God. And when we truly believe in the hope that the gospel presents, then we will be bold, we will not lose heart, and we will have confidence in the adequacy of our ministry. Let me just close with a story. And that one of my heroes of faith is a missionary by the name of James Fraser. James Utram Fraser. Uh, 
and he worked among the Lisu people of Yunnan province in the early 1900s. But he faced a lot of setbacks, a lot of difficulties. After spending six years working among the tribal people, a people that were plagued with alcoholism, with demon worship, few people were very interested in the gospel and no church was planted. He managed to convert one family, but then that family eventually gave up the faith and reverted back to ancestor worship. Besides the lack of fruit in his ministry, living conditions were also difficult. He was lonely, the only foreigner, the only Christian for hundreds of miles. His diet was meager, his, rent, his rented room was constantly infected, infested with fleas. And all of this led him to despair, to apathy, to depression, and causing him to wonder whether he should move to a different location that was more promising. But in the midst of the difficulties and setbacks that he faced, that James Fraser faced, he maintained confidence in the validity of his ministry to the Lisu people, and he never gave that up. And he was able to do this by reminding himself of two things, that the strength of his ministry comes from God, and that the only way that he can tap into that strength is through faithful prayer. So he kept on writing to his supporters, to his mother, pray for it. Not pray for it as a sideline, but pray for it as though their salvation of the people I'm ministering to ultimately depends upon your prayer. It is not a side job, but it is an important task. Secondly, he also gained confidence in that the substance of his ministry, the gospel, was indeed the only way to have life with God, the only way that was able to set the villagers free from bondage to Satan. He persevered in his ministry among the Lisu people, and four months after he hit rock bottom, 600 Lisu people representing 130 families turned away from Satan and followed Jesus Christ. And today, there are about 300,000 Lisu Christians in China, and not counting those in Thailand and Myanmar. And the Li Su script, the handwriting, the script that he developed is still used and is still recognized by the Chinese government since 1992. Despite setbacks, despite difficulties, we can't be confident about the adequacy of our for ministry, but confidence is a subjective thing. It's a subjective emotional response. But Paul tells us that this subjective emotional response to our confidence does not depend on external circumstances. Rather, it rests on two objective facts, two clear things that never change us, namely that our strength for ministry comes from God. And the gospel we proclaim it is the power for salvation to everyone who believes. Let's pray. Father, I pray that we would take the words of Paul to our hearts. That as we go out to minister in whatever capacity that we find ourselves in, that when we face opposition, we face setbacks, when we even despair, despair of life itself, Help us, Lord, to find our confidence, not in ourselves, but our confidence in you, our confidence in your strength and in the power of your gospel. Amen.